I'm just put me like that. All right, it's about 12 o'clock here in Arkansas. I think we'll go ahead and get started with today's uh, program. This is the Beaver Watershed Alliance quarterly speaker series. And our topic today is innovative funding mechanisms for conservation and restoration. We're all uh, very excited to have you all here today. Hope everyone's staying warm, um, no matter where you are. And uh, we have a great lineup of speakers today. Um, so we look forward to today's program. Um, I want to start out a little bit about the Beaver Watershed Alliance. Uh, we're a nonprofit located up in Northwest Arkansas, working to proactively protect, enhance, and sustain water quality in Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. And we do that through education and outreach, um, technical assistance, and scientific monitoring. The Beaver Lake Reservoir is an impaired reservoir in Northwest Arkansas, um, and it is an Arkansas state priority watershed. And our biggest challenges are uh, sediment and nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen. And Beaver Lake is important to our region because it supplies water for over half a million people. And it also produces hydroelectric power. It's a big recreation and tourism um, spot. And it's really a cornerstone of our community for growth and economic development. Uh, the Alliance works with several partners and we just wanted to say thank you to all of our partners that help make our work possible. And all of our speakers today, we want to thank them for joining for today's uh, speaker series. So we have Allison Souders, who's going to kick us off. She's with the US EPA Clean Water Fund. Allison is a financial analyst for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund at EPA headquarters in Washington, DC. Uh, though the Clean Water Fund is more known for financing gray infrastructure projects, her work has mostly focused on increasing the amount of assistance going to non-point source and conservation projects across the country. Prior to EPA, Allison was a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal and worked for a USAID contractor. So Allison, I'm going to stop sh uh, sharing my screen and hand this over to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Let me get this set up to share my um, presentation real quick. Thanks for introducing me. Um, like Becky said, I'm Allison Souders with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund at EPA headquarters in Washington, DC. Um, oops, just trying to figure out how to get this to do. Full screen, whoa. Full screen mode, sorry about that. Can everyone see the presentation? I might just leave it like this. Okay, so. I'm gonna start off with kind of a general overview from the federal level of the state revolving funds. Um, for Arkansas specific things, I'll probably um, obviously let that to Debbie who will be speaking later um, from the Arkansas program. So to get started, the CWSRF, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund um, operates in all states in Puerto Rico and they are capitalized annually by a, 
By a grant from the US EPA, the state then provides a 20% match and many states also choose to leverage their programs by going to the bond market. The states then use these funds to make low interest loans to eligible assistance recipients for water quality improvement projects. Um, the principal repayments and interest earnings are then recycled back into each program and used to finance new projects, allowing the funds to revolve over time. So in general, the CWF SRAPs offer terms up to 30 years or the useful life of the project, whichever is less. Um, we offer below, below market interest rates um, from zero to market rate. Um, savings called additional subsidies that we'll talk about on the next slide that can kind of help um, ease some of the burden of a loan for some borrowers. Um, and generally repayment starts one year after project completion. So like I mentioned, the CWSRFs can offer something called additional subsidization. Um, we can offer it in the form of loan forgiveness, negative interest rate loans and grants. Each state decides based on federal requirements where to target this additional subsidization. Um, but at least 10% of the funds each year have to go to this. So this slide is, a calc is showing a calculator that the Environmental Finance Center at the University of Car North Carolina created to show the savings that CWSRF loans can offer. Um, and they would, it would work for any program across the country. So if you kind of look here, this is looking at a loan that includes some principal forgiveness, like I mentioned, is part of the ad sub. The subsidized interest rate of 1.5%, which is half the market rate, which is kind of accurate um, for most states right now, and then the estimated project cost. So in this case, on the $500 loan um, with the lower interest rate and $10,000 of principal forgiveness, the borrower would save over $116,000 over the life of the loan, which ends up being um, equivalent to a grant. So the CWSRF, Potential borrowers must identify a repayment source, which might not be, um, it may not be as easy for um, nonprofits or watershed organizations to come up with a revenue stream, whereas a municipality or water utility can use their um, user rates. So we've seen a lot of borrowers um, with creative repayment streams like timber harvest revenues, um, we've seen carbon credits go back to repaying a land conservation, um, a land conservation loan, homeowners association fees, hunting licenses, um, et cetera. There's been lots of different cases and the CWS or the state programs will usually help, help out um, figuring that out. So next, the, this is just an overview of the statutory eligibilities offered by the Clean Water Act for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, there are 12 in total, but they are very broad in scope, ranging from, of course, um, construction and updates of publicly owned treatment works and um, implementation of non-point source management plans or any um, national estuary program CCMPs, but there's, um, myriad of other eligibilities that can go toward watershed protection and restoration. Um, to take a look at the full suite, you can go ahead and there's the link on this um, slide. So these are just a few of the project categories um, that we offer federally that would maybe have to do with watershed restoration and protection, um, land conservation, source water protection, Ag best management practices, which I know Arkansas does a good bit of, um, groundwater protection, habitat restoration, and again, you can look at the overview of our eligibilities to learn more about those. Um, so these eligibilities are state specific. So um, I I'm pretty sure this slide lines up with Arkansas in most cases, except for private entities. For um, has a caveat. But for programs federally, um, who is eligible to borrow would be communities. Um, we see a lot of municipalities, treatment plants, um, conservation districts, nonprofits. Um, there's been private entities in several states that have worked with the CWSRF in different ways and citizen groups. 
So just to kind of show the scope of the program, um, we have provided $145.5 billion for water quality improvement projects since the program started in 1988. Um, that's about 42,000 assistance agreements or projects if you if, can equate roughly to that. Um, however, something that we're working to kind of quicken the pace of the upward trend is that just 3.6% of the overall funding nationally has gone towards non-point source pollution. Um, whereas a lot of the water pollution now is actually coming from those sources. So we're trying to kind of even out where um, the funding towards non-point source pollution, where it's actually coming from. Um, the next slide shows some of the innovative financing structures that Clean Water State Revolving Fund programs offer around the country, which may not be um, the case for Arkansas, but um, this, this document, the financing options for non-traditional eligibilities actually has um, sections for each, each option and different case studies from states. Um, most of these financing mechanisms are to help um, reduce burden for the borrowers or to help reach borrowers who may not otherwise be eligible. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so now I'll just give a few different examples. Um, they're not necessarily from Arkansas, but this would be possible in Arkansas. Um, so the CWSRF can provide match for grants. Um, in this case, the Cocoa Beach, Florida Minuteman Causeway project was for um, green infrastructure, and they got a low interest rate loan to provide match for the 319 non-point source grant. Um, there are many partnership opportunities in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, we've seen a lot of projects be co-funded by multiple sources and um, kind of gotten off the ground, um, championed by um, folks who might not even be a borrower. So this was a project in Virginia. Um, in the last few years, that was actually um, the largest open space conservation easement in the um, state. So the Nature Conservancy worked with the VA Department of Forestry and the Clean Water State Revolving Fund um, to make that happen. So, and I'll just kind of quickly go over um, the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund has set asides available for source water protection that some states take advantage of. Um, and they can provide loans to public water systems for source water protection, easements, um, the plannings, and capacity development. So the next slide is just an example of how the programs can work together as well um, to kind of leverage, leverage their funds. So this was a project in Skagit, Washington, where a DWSRF grant from their local assistance set aside um, was used to appraise the property value. And then the community was able to take that information to the CWSRF and got a loan to purchase the 250 acres of forest. So, um, so at headquarters, we've been discussing the concept of watershed finance partnerships, um, implementing water quality projects on a watershed basis, using some mix of SRF financing, um, public, private, just kind of getting groups together in a watershed. Um, and we've been thinking about, and partners, need not be the actual borrower. There are several roles um, that organizations may be able to play regardless of whether they're able to take on a loan or not. Um, a watershed partner may act as a broker identifying non-point source projects within the watershed and kind of presenting them or bringing them to the CWSRF or DWSRF for funding. Um, they may act as an intermediary funding projects, taking on the loan and then making sub loans or grants to additional partners to implement projects. And um, lastly, the watershed partner could actually receive the loan to implement a group of projects within their watershed. So wrapping up, these are kind of next steps. Um, reach out to Debbie Dixon, reach out to Arkansas or the state that you are in. Um, the next slide has a link to the state, to the different state programs, because I understand there are some folks here from outside of Arkansas 
So you would want to check your state program's intended use plan. Um, and that is where each state lists um, what they can fund for the coming year. And sign up for the newsletter for updates. Um, I can provide that link in the chat too. And if anyone have questions, go ahead and I guess ask in the chat, but um, that is all for now. So here, um, not sure if these slides will be shared, but I can provide these links to anyone that would like them. And reach out if you have any questions. Here's my email address and also just our general inbox, probably easier to remember. So thank you. Well, thank you, Allison. Um, we do have one question here, um, a little time to for that question. Um, and while we're doing this, uh, Jeff, you can go ahead and pull up your screen. And um, so Allison, uh, does the EPA Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund, um, oops, where do you go? There we go, have a federal level guidance for prioritizing green infrastructure versus gray infrastructure? Um, this person says, I know the state can and does set their own priorities. Right, that's correct. So the state does um, set their own priorities and direct their financing to those projects. Um, we don't have actual federal level guidance for prioritizing green infrastructure versus gray. Um, we have a lot of documents out there, like the financing options paper, kind of hoping to um, provide some support to states and borrowers who might be interested in gr green infrastructure. And then we also have um, a federal requirement called the Green Project Reserve. Um, where a certain portion of projects in each state each year have to go towards um, innovation, water efficiency, energy efficiency, which put in, in um, include stormwater. I hope that helps. Thank you, Allison. And thanks, Evan, for the question. We appreciate that. And um, yeah, before I introduce our next speaker, um, this presentation will be recorded and available on the Beaver Watershed Alliance YouTube channel. Um, and if you do want a copy of today's presentations, please do reach out and we'd be happy to connect you with the speakers or have a copy of the presentations. So, okay. Our next speaker is Jeff Lerner. And um, Jeff is with the uh, U.S. Endowment and Healthy Watersheds Consortium. For the past seven years, uh, Jeff has helped develop and manage the Healthy Watersheds Consortium grant program focused on protecting watershed lands to prevent degradation on behalf of the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities and in conjunction with the EPA and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. He has had over 25 years of experience with forest and other habitat conservation throughout the U.S., has worked for several national conservation organizations, and holds degrees in zoology, conservation biology, and sustainable development. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Glad to have you here. Super. Thank you, Becky. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Terrific. Well, hello everybody. Uh, it's great to be here and, and thanks again to the Beaver Watershed Alliance for having me. Uh, I'm here to provide perhaps a little inspiration and some examples on advancing watershed protection through state clean water and drinking water revolving loan funds. Uh, as, as Becky indicated with the intro, I currently help coordinate the Healthy Watersheds Consortium Grant Program, which was in fact conceived by the Environmental Protection Agency and is, has become a partnership with the Nat Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, and the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, all as equal funding partners. And I work as a consultant to the endowment, which manages the program. And Healthy Watersheds was, again, as Becky indicated, designed to accelerate the protection of watersheds and keep them intact. Um, and the program support has supported the capacity of groups like the Beaver Watershed Alliance to advance watershed initiatives with utilities, communities, private landowners, and to help overcome some of the hurdles um, in getting to protecting more watershed lands. And one of the biggest hurdles that many of our our grantees have encountered is funding or financing. And we came to see the SRFs as possible solutions. 
Allison gave a great overview of the SRFs. Um, I just want to reiterate that across the country, there is a lot of money revolving in these funds and also that they can be used to address non-point source pollution, including the prevention of that pollution, um, as you saw from some of the examples related to land conservation, and also for the protection specifically of source water areas. <clears throat> and since these funds are mostly loans, that means they must be paid back, and that's easier to do with a traditional infrastructure project. Uh, it's somewhat harder to do for other pieces of watershed infrastructure, like this stream and the surrounding forest, but it's not impossible. And one of our grantees, the Western Rivers Conservancy, did protect uh, this 47,000 acre area uh, using a combination of sources, including uh, an SRF loan. And the loan was for about $19 million, which was about a third of the costs of this project. And it went to the Yurok tribe, which is a big partner in this effort. Um, and the loan interest rate was, I believe, at 0%. So the Yurok tribe will own these lands um, and they will manage them as a salmon sanctuary and a community forest. And the loan will be repaid using sustainable timber harvest revenue and carbon credits. So this was a really, really big project and it took many years to accomplish. Um, and there were many other sources of funding that were involved, but the SRF dollars were really a key component as a way to finance a part of this project. A more recent example comes from Portland, Maine, where another one of our grantees is working closely with the Portland Water District to protect the Sebago Lake watershed, which serves about 200,000 people. The district has made an annual commitment to watershed protection for several years, which then is leveraged with other dollars that are often raised by some of their partners, which are usually local land trusts. The Sebago Clean Water Initiative um, recently um, worked with the Portland Water District to help secure a drinking water SRF loan and also a grant from the program to help pay for the protection in the watershed and to help create a, about a 1500 acre community forest in the process. And so then building on that momentum, the Portland Water District successfully applied recently to the NRCS RCPP program and now has an $8 million grant from that program, which they're going to then leverage further into about $19 million of funding overall, which will give them the ability to protect another 7,000 acres. So you can see that they're rapidly moving in the direction of implementing their larger um, watershed protection goals. And they're likely going to use SRF again as part of that package of leverage for their RCPP grant. Another watershed initiative with an emerging use of SRF comes from Texas. Uh, the Texas Hill Country Conservation Network works in several watersheds in uh, the Austin area, Austin metro area. There are um, several opportunities to protect private ranch lands, which can help conserve drinking water supply and prevent non-point source pollutants. And Austin has had a, a watershed protection program for many years. And so the network is working to expand that concept to other communities. Accessing the SRF is uh, for watershed protection is kind of a new idea in the state. And they've recently worked with Hayes County, one of the surrounding communities to propose a $30 million SRF loan to support a water quality land protection fund, which could be used for multiple protection projects. And the loan is um, being considered currently as part of the state uh, intended use plan. Uh, the, those IUPs or intended use plans that Allison mentioned are developed each year. Um, and this, uh, this $30 million loan is currently being considered for funding. And if it's successful, they plan to work with additional communities on similar loans. So bundling watershed projects into a single loan or creating a protection fund is a fairly novel idea. Although it might be worth noting that my understanding is SRFs do have the ability to support portfolio financing or programmatic financing. So there may be sort of a, a precedent for this kind of thinking within the SRFs. And so far I've talked about SRF loans for watershed protection, but 
it's not always easy to find that revenue stream to repay a loan. And so while you can use SRF funds to protect watersheds, many states uh, do not do that currently uh, and possibly because there's no revenue stream for that repayment. But the SRFs can be creative and flexible. And one approach that partly solves this problem is called sponsorship. And it was listed uh, among the different innovative finance mechanisms that Allison had in her presentation. And it's a way to fund watershed projects by connecting them to more traditional loans. So the way that this works is that a large, larger infrastructure project adopts or sponsors a watershed protection or restoration project in the same loan agreement. And by lowering the interest rates, the SRF can use a part of those funds to pay for the sponsorship project. The lowered rate is an incentive to the borrower and it may not hurt the overall program financially and it accomplishes your non-point source pollution reduction and prevention goals. The loan in this case is doing double duty for both traditional infrastructure and what you might call green infrastructure. And a key point is that funding for the sponsorship project is not considered a grant. And for it to work, the cost of the watershed project needs to be much less than the infrastructure project. And it also helps if the interest rates are higher, so there's more flexibility to adjust them. And right now we know interest rates are fairly low. Um, some state SRFs can make discounted incentive loan rates to make it attractive to the borrower. So if you look at this slide, you can see that by adjusting that interest rate from 3.8% to 0.3%, you can make it such that the cost of doing the project, um, the traditional project, or the project with the sponsored project along with it is essentially the same over a 20 year period. And it works. Uh, credit really goes to the Ohio EPA for dreaming up this idea about 20 years ago. Um, they've had a, a program going for that length of time and it's, it's been, it continues to be going strong. It's a sophisticated program with a separate application process and the agency employs watershed ecologists that can help advise on projects and ultimately approve them. And um, compared to the size of their overall SRF, this is not a large program, but they do contribute $15 million a year and that can get a lot done. And it's also worth comparing to your traditional section 319 grant funds, which are allocated among the states. So in Arkansas, those non-point source pollution reduction or prevention grants are funded at approximately $2 million a year. And so theoretically, let's say if Arkansas created a sponsorship program, it might be able to double or triple the funding for non-point source projects throughout the state. And it's worth noting that the SRFs keep increasing in size over time as well. And just to put a fine point on this, one of our other grantees uh, helps coordinate something called the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative. And they work cooperatively to preserve and restore eight major watersheds uh, up in Northern Ohio. They work collaboratively to preserve um, uh, these lands in, in collaboration with the Northeast Ohio Sewer District, which serves the, the Cleveland Metro area specifically. And they utilize the Ohio Sponsorship Program among other sources to fund protection and restoration projects. Um, and, they, and they work pretty closely with local governments. Um, they've also developed a pretty ambitious uh, protection goal of over 300,000 acres and about 3,000 stream miles. But they've also estimated the price tag for that work to be about $475 million. So that sounds like a really large number, but it's also a very large watershed area that they've focused on and uh, spread over 25 years and over 80 communities and parts of 16 counties, it becomes to, you know, begins to seem a little bit more manageable to get to that, that large goal of funding. And because they already work with the SRF, the collaborative is considering other ways they might look to the SRF for additional financing options. Okay, the last example I wanted to share the Catawba Watery Watershed serves the Charlotte metro area in North and South Carolina. And they, uh, they're, this is where another one of our grantees is located. Uh, this initiative involves 18 different water utilities that meet regularly as something called the Water Management Group. The partners recently completed a new source water protection tool to help guide their active protection efforts. 
In the last couple of years, they've protected about 15,000 acres of land in the watershed. And most of this protection is funded with uh, traditional grant sources. But we've recently introduced them to the idea of sponsorship. And we had some good discussions with the SRFs in um, both North Carolina and South Carolina and the utilities, many of whom already borrow from the SRF are interested in trying some sponsorship projects. And so that's where we are now in trying to identify where these projects might be and bringing those ideas forward to the SRF. And I'd also say that because of the strong partnership that exists here among the utilities, coordinating something like a watershed financing partnership like Allison talked about in this landscape might be much easier. And in fact, would be kind of the preferred option uh, from the SRS perspective because they'd be getting all of these different uh, projects kind of coordinated together in a watershed initiative. Okay, so bringing things back to Arkansas, as I wrap up, I just wanted to emphasize that connection between land and water. I wanna point out the recently completed state forest action plan. These plans were updated in most states at the end of last year, and the Arkansas plan includes a water supply protection strategy. Uh, it's a couple pages of um, useful objectives and actions, and I just wanted to highlight the strategic focus on drinking water supply watersheds and some of the expected outcomes that they have, which are ambitious. Um, these plans uh, developed in each of the states are also connected to the US Forest Service funding, which goes to many of the states and therefore might be an opportunity to leverage with state SRF funding as well. The map that I'm showing here shows the priority drinking water supply watersheds uh, that are in the plan. And I should also mention that one of our other grantees is Central Arkansas Water in the Little Rock area, uh, which recently issued um, a green bond to help pay for protection and is already starting to explore some additional financing uh, by working with the SRF. Um, and I think part of their strategy also involves working with the US Forest Service directly and some of those US Forest Service funding programs. So for some next steps you might wanna consider, um, in, in my experience talking with uh, about this topic in different states, it's really helpful if you can have specific project ideas in mind when talking to the SRFs, because then they can provide feedback and advice on how a project might be funded, either through the clean water SRF or possibly the drinking water SRF, or as Allison mentioned, maybe a combination of both. Um, and something to also think about is maybe starting with just a pilot project to help get the ball rolling. Um, I don't know if, if Arkansas will ultimately want to create a sponsorship program like Ohio has, but certainly that would be an option, but you know, a, a pilot to get the ball rolling might be a good option. So uh, I've been really um, thrilled to have the opportunity to work on the Healthy Watersheds program. It's great to be part of the conversations for some of these large visions for conservation, which often affect hundreds of thousands of acres of land and thousands of water users. And, they, and we know that they need to be executed over many, many years. And so that lends themselves, in my opinion, toward uh, larger financing solutions. And if watersheds are part of our water infrastructure, they may be able to be financed in similar ways with the help of the SRFs. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody um, a little bit more about the program that we have um, or about um, how to connect uh, SRFs with some of these different uh, watershed protection efforts. So thanks again. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Becky. Thank you, Jeff. We really appreciate those examples across the US. Um, hopefully maybe inspire some ideas and partnerships uh, here in, in, in Arkansas. So, okay. And just a reminder to everybody, um, we welcome questions. You can use the Q and A uh, box down there or the chat, either way, we'll see your questions and we're happy to answer those as we go along or if you want to save them for the end, um, just want to make sure you um, know that we encourage your questions today. Okay, so um, our next speaker, Debbie, if you want to 
Just go ahead and share your screen. I'll work on introducing you today. Debbie Dixon is with the Arkansas Department of Agriculture, the Natural Resources Division. Uh, Debbie's a program financial manager, um, helping communities to secure funding for water and sewer infrastructure. Debbie is a graduate of Capella University with a Bachelor of Science in Information and Technology, a certificate in accounting, and over 30 years of accounting experience in various industries, including governmental accounting. So Debbie, we really appreciate uh, the Arkansas perspective brought in today, along with the um, EPA and, and case studies across the US. So we're really excited to have you talk a little bit more about uh, what Arkansas is doing with this program and, and how we might all work together. Well, first, let me just ask if I'm, I've got the correct screen shared up there. Can you see the main uh, screen? Yep, yes, it looks good. Oh. Okay, so I will move on and thank you for asking me to speak today and to bring to uh, our participants a, a, a kind of overview of the state revolving funds in Arkansas. And in Arkansas, the Natural Resources Division, which has recently been moved under the Arkansas Department of Agriculture, manages both the clean water and the drinking water state revolving fund. So we have a little bit of a one stop shop. Hold on. There we go. So our our goal is to provide low interest uh, solutions to your water and sewer infrastructure needs, and that includes the watershed management. Um, we really are looking for uh, good projects uh, to come to us and to help uh, help you figure out how to fund those. We currently manage the two federal programs, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. And we also have three state programs that can also fund these types of projects. The eligible entities are a little different. Um, for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, we currently have a requirement that it has to be a governmental entity. We do have the option to waive that and we have done so several times in the past. For the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, we have the option of doing private entities as well or non-traditional governmental entities. And then the state funds, we can do either or. Under the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, we typically do sewer infrastructure projects. That doesn't mean that we don't have the option for other projects. We do run a agriculture water quality loan program. It's a link deposit program through our Clean Water State Revolving Fund to get some non-point source reductions in, at, at the farm level, at the agriculture level available. But for the most part, our traditional loans and loans with principal forgiveness are going to be for sewer infrastructure. But with all of that said, we're always open to additional project types. Under drinking water, it's, it's very similar. Uh, we do traditionally uh, water system infrastructure projects. And under our drinking water, we have to have uh, proof that the, these projects meet public use tests as prescribed by the federal tax code. Our current lending rates for our uh, clean water and drinking water are set based on term. We have a fee that becomes a part of our lending rate. That's how we collect our fees in Arkansas and our, both of our SRF programs. So we stagger these depending on the type of project, the life of the project, and the uh, ability of the borrower to repay. So we will offer additional subsidization for those that meet those requirements. If you've met the requirement for additional subsidization, the state does uh, give additional priority to projects that, mean green, that meet green project standards or regionalization. In addition, on the clean water program, we have a special lending rate for projects in the Illinois River Basin and the Buffalo River watershed, and also for regionalization projects. We offer a, a, an additional reduced rate for a maximum term up to 30 years, depending on the life of the project. Our state lending program rates are a little bit higher. 
Um, and again, we stagger those for either project life or uh, entity's ability to repay. In addition on the clean water, or excuse me, in addition on the state funded programs, we have a 3% loan origination fee that's due at the time of the loan closing. And it can be taken out of the loan proceeds. The drinking water set asides are actually managed by the Department of Health within the state of Arkansas through their engineering section. They manage the small system technical assistance, the uh, uh, water systems management program, the wellhead protection program, and the capacity development program. If anybody has questions about those programs or how they function or work, please don't hesitate to contact me and then I can send you to the right person at Department of Health. When should you contact us? The sooner you can contact us to tell us what you're considering for a project, what options you're looking at, maybe who you're working with, the sooner we can guide you in the best way to apply for those funds through our process. One of the great ways that, that we work um, as funding agencies in the state is we have uh, created what's called the WAC Committee, which is the Water and Wastewater Advisory Committee. If you have a project that you're not sure where it can be funded, you fill out this simple application. There's no engineering required in order to fill out this application. You fill out what your problem is or what your goal is and how you think you're going to accomplish that. You submit that application and then our funding sources will reply back to you and tell you where you could get funding for that, where it would be eligible to receive funding. And that saves you some uh, application time if you're not sure you're eligible under all of those. What is our current application process? For Arkansas Natural Resources, for all of our state and federal funded programs, you are required to submit an application through the WAC committee first. They meet on the first Wednesday of each month. Once they've met and considered your application, they will send out a response telling you where they would recommend you get funding. Once you've received that, you can submit your funding application to Arkansas Natural Resources Commission, and that's available on our website. The Arkansas Natural Resources Commission meets monthly, excuse me, bi-monthly on the third Thursday. So we have a new project, a new uh, pilot project that we're starting um, that it's uh, for septic tank remediation. We've chosen the Illinois River watershed and the Upper White Beaver Lake watershed for this initial implementation to see how successful it is. You, we've got contact information here. We do not yet have applications available. We're still working through some of the pre-setup uh, pre items in order to get the project funding, but we've allocated $1 million out of the clean water SRF for both, the, both of these watershed areas. Coming, coming attractions to me are the, uh, the new things that we're working on within our, within our agency. We're moving towards a online system so that all applications, disbursements, signatures, everything can be done through an online application or an online process so that not only can our applicants and borrowers get to their data and submit their information online, our internal staff will have a quick reference and be able to help them through the process easier and quick, quickly. In, in addition to moving to this online process, we have been working towards streamlining our processes and removing additional requirements that maybe are no longer needed by the federal program and to help shorten our timelines from the time the application is received until the construction can start. So here's our bottom line. We want to protect our water and land resources to provide safe, and economical benefits for the state of Arkansas. So we're looking to you guys to bring us your ideas and your questions on how we can reach those goals. And here we have, if you have any questions, you can contact Ms. Deborah Banks, our program outreach coordinator, or myself. And uh, there's a, an email for each of us and a generic email that you can contact if you're not sure who you would like to speak to directly. And with that, I will turn it back to Becky. Wonderful, Debbie. Well, 
congratulations on all those uh, upcoming attractions coming to to make that to streamline that process is going to be really helpful i know that's a so. lot of work i'm sure <laughs> we're still doing it it probably won't be till fall that we really get there yeah well that's um that's just really great so we did have a question on um what is the typical time timeline for an SRF project as far as the approval process? So um, it depends on how far the project is in the design phase. So we accept projects that have zero design completed. So you can apply to us for funding prior to hiring your consulting engineer if you show choose. So it it'll, a lot depends on that process. If you come to us in at that stage, and you have a simple process, or excuse me, a simple project like a pipe replacement, we should be able to get you through our entire process, loan closed, be able to start construction within six months. If we're talking about a plant upgrade or anything that requires permit changes, it could add additional time based on what those requirements are or how long it takes to design that project. Thank you. Well, let's see. And I think that's um, any other questions for anyone. I had a question about just in general. Um, could we maybe think about um, maybe get an example of um, how this might be applied in the Beaver Lake watershed for a non point source project? Like if the if we wanted to look at a stream restoration or a some forest management, um, would there be an example that we could uh, maybe hear about on how to accomplish that? Are you asking if there's an example within the state of Arkansas already? Yes. I would say no. <laughs> we have not done that that I'm aware of with our state revolving funds. We have a 319 program in our agency that will that has done some funding like that, um, but we have not. And the only reason we have not is we haven't had anybody approach us in in with a project that we could actually come through with with a way to fund it through the state revolving funds. Now I think we've done some um, state grants for similar projects. But we would definitely be open to um, doing the um, the partnership where if we could offer a reduced interest rate for a larger project, you know, if you can work with, you know, a larger project within the area for an, a traditional infrastructure project, we could definitely look at something like that. Um, where we usually struggle is on um, repayments. So. Um... I've, I've heard of a principal forgiveness. Is that something that's part of the Arkansas program? Or is that, uh, what, what would be the criteria for that if that is an option? Principal forgiveness is, is, is deter eligibility for principal forgiveness is determined based on the customers of benefit or the area of benefit. So we're still struggling a little bit with how to allocate principal forgiveness to non-traditional projects. So right now we look at um, median household income. So in order to, to qualify, you either have to have rates um, at 1.5% of the median household income for the project area, or at least 51% of the customers who benefit have to either have low or moderate income as defined by the Department, US Department of Housing and Urban Developments and have 1.25% of median household income. So with that said, a stream bank restoration project would not have traditional users. So we would have to probably uh, look at maybe the watershed as a whole uh, as the beneficiary and if we could qualify it under that. We have some options that we could work with that. And again, if you came to us with a specific project, 
it would help us figure out how to move through those to get it into the eligibility list. And that includes principal forgiveness. Thank you. Jeff or Allison, um, any other comments or uh, anything we want to share with the group today on this topic? I mean, I would just reiterate, you know, kind of a little bit about what uh, what Debbie said about bringing projects forward. I think I've had some different conversations with SRFs around the country, and there are a number of considerations uh, that they have to evaluate to think about funding a project. And I think Debbie did a good job of describing that, but they might fall into different categories like does the program have the financial wherewithal to be able to afford to do these types of non-traditional projects? Are there policy changes that might need to take place in order to make it possible? Although it sounds like there's a lot of flexibility within Arkansas now. Um, and then some SRFs have asked, is there a pipeline of projects? Are there, is there a demand for these types of projects? So if you're gonna go ahead and create a new program or offer another way of utilizing your SRF, is there gonna be a demand? And so that's where I'd say, I'd kind of put it back on the audience here and say, if you, if you bring project ideas forward and the SRF's aware that there's an interest, then I think they can, um, they can think of more about um, how to, how to accommodate that and, and build programs appropriately around those types of needs. Mm -hmm. And to, to, to add to that, I would just like to say that oftentimes it's not so much getting, getting the, um, the policies changed. We can usually work through that process. It's implementing the first one. Once you get through that first project and how to get there and how to fund it and how to approve it and what requirements are changed, then the next one is a lot easier because you've already set everything in place. So getting through that first one is usually the most difficult. So having people come to us with suggestions and ideas or projects in particular that they want to accomplish and complete will help us get through that process and see if we can figure out a way to fund it. Yeah, I would just agree with everything that Deborah and Nick said, bringing the projects to the SRF. Um, Jeff had talked about the importance of like the different partnerships and relationships. So um, if I was a watershed organization, I'd probably reach out to my local utility and the SRF. Um, Arkansas is uniquely set up with the, um, <clears throat> the WAC. Um, so it sounds like partnerships could be kind of, um, Put together a little bit easier there since you're coming into most of the water um, funders in the state so i guess another consideration is maybe uh thinking about srfs as a as a component of funding for some of these you know whether it's sponsorship or whether it's a traditional loan uh, it may not cover the entire cost of what you're trying to do, but having um, having additional funds that could potentially be used as match to other federal programs that you might apply for competitively, whether it's forest service money or, or uh, NRCS money or other money, you know, maybe an SRF could actually be utilized that way. I think you'd have to think about the source of the funding because some of the money as Allison indicated is federal and then some of it is is state money but to me it seems like that could be worked out such that you may actually be able to have non-federal match for some of these other competitive grant programs and that might be a way of fleshing out your your finance for a large uh, watershed project or bundle of projects. Well, we just wanted to say thank you all so much, Allison, Jeff, and Debbie for being here today. And we also wanna thank everybody that joined with us online. Um, again, this, uh, this presentation was through the Beaver Watershed Alliance. This is our speaker series. We, we put these on quarterly to talk about 
um, the investments for source uh, water drinking supplies. If you'd like more information about us or anything you've heard today, uh, feel free to contact us at info at beaverwatershedalliance.org. It's our email, or you can dial 479-750-8007. Um, we also have a number of ways to connect with us um, through Facebook, uh, our YouTube channel. We will put these programs online. Uh, we have a podcast called We Are Water, and we also encourage you to visit our website to learn more. So I think with that, um, we finished a little bit early, so which is great. And again, just thank you all so much for being here today. And um, yeah, hope everybody stays warm and has a good rest of your day. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. You. Appreciate it.